In this video, we'll go over two-stage op-amp compensation. Compensation in the two-stage op-amp essentially boils down to selecting the values of the components in the compensation network here, CC and RC. In fact, this can be done fairly systematically by following this simple step-by-step -step procedure. First, we are assuming that we're dealing with a situation like this, where the two-stage op-amp has passive feedback connected around it with the uh, formed by the impedances Z1 and Z2. If these are resistors, then this looks like a simple inverting configuration. Um, another common situation in analog integrated circuits is that the impedances Z1 and Z2 are capacitors that arises, for example, in each phase of a switch capacitor circuit operation. In any case, uh, when we start out with an uncompensated two-stage op-amp, we're likely to have two poles in pretty close proximity to each other, one due to the output of the first stage and one at the output of the second stage. So we want to start out with some nominal value for CC, um, something that's not too ridiculous, but just a nominal value that splits the poles at the output of the first and second stage a little bit so that we can clearly distinguish them in looking at the frequency response uh, of the op-amp. So um, a good choice initially is to select the value for CC as given by this expression. Um, the values of GM1 and GM7 can be found just from a DC operating point analysis of the two-stage op-amp, or it can even be approximately calculated um, by hand, just knowing bias currents that are flowing in each of the two stages and some technology parameters. Um, the load cap value is hopefully something you know, and beta is determined simply by the ratio of the passive feedback components. So selecting the compensation capacitor value in this way, initially, places the loop's unity gain frequency around the frequency of the second pole. And you can refer to the textbook for the derivation that explains that, but essentially selecting the compensation capacitor at this value should give you somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 degrees phase margin. Um, probably not enough, but uh, it's certainly enough to allow you to clearly discern the first and second poles of the op-amp when looking at its frequency, open loop frequency response. At this stage, you should not have RC included. You should just have RC set to a very, very small value of, uh, you know, for example, 0.1 ohms in the schematic. From here, frequency compensation proceeds as follows. First, we're going to do dominant pole compensation by increasing the value of CC to give us uh, an amount of phase margin that's still not quite equal to our target value, uh, but is uh, close. Then finally, we're going to introduce the lead compensating resistor RC and select its value to give us an additional, say, 20, 25 or so degrees of phase margin and allow us to achieve our final targeted phase margin. So in this, uh, these examples, this example I'm going to work through, we're going to do dominant pole compensation. To give us 55 degrees of phase margin. And then we're going to do lead compensation. To give us another say 20 to 30 degrees of phase margin and get us up to a total of 75 to 85 degrees of phase margin but once you understand the premises at play here you can play with these numbers here how much phase margin do you get from the dominant pole compensation and how much additional do you get from the lead compensating resistor rc um, you can modify the number slightly the main things to understand the premise here so um Having introduced the nominal value for CC that was introduced in the last slide, you can break the loop and perform an AC analysis 
of the two-stage op-amp to find a bode plot of the open loop gain L versus frequency. So um, you should see a large low frequency gain and then the dominant, let's uh, pull over here, a dominant pole here, and then a second pole somewhere around the unity gain frequency here. So this is what you would get initially. So um, the dominant pole here would give rise to 45 degrees phase margin there. And then you would have another 45 degrees phase margin there. And in fact, by the time you get out to very high frequencies, you've probably got third and high order poles. So the phase response would continue to roll off. So um, the first step here is to perform dominant pole compensation, as I said, and we're going to shoot for 55 degrees of phase margin in the dominant pole compensation. So in order to do that, we're going to look for the frequency where the unity gain um, omega t would need to be in order to get that 55 degrees. Um, so that would correspond to the frequency at which the phase response of L is equal to minus 125 degrees. So we can just read that off the Bode plot that comes from our simulation, right? Whatever frequency that is where we've got, where L has a phase shift of minus 125 degrees, that's where we would like omega t to be, right? So we're gonna try and push omega t here using dominant pole compensation. So in order to do that, let me just see if I can draw this properly. We're going to need to reduce the dominant pole by a certain amount here. Um, the amount by which we need to reduce the dominant pole is equal to the gain observed here. So let's say the gain here is A prime. What we need to do is reduce the dominant pole by a factor of A prime. And we can do that by increasing the value of the compensation capacitor from its nominal value in step one by a factor of A prime, since the dominant pole frequency is approximately proportional to the value of CC. So increasing the compensation capacitor in this way should increase, uh, should decrease the dominant pole frequency and decrease the unity gain frequency, uh, as shown in the green sketch there, without hardly affecting the second pole frequency. If anything, it may increase it slightly due to pole splitting. So the resulting phase response would look like this. The dominant pole would be shifted down, but that wouldn't have much effect on the phase margin since in any case, the dominant pole was already contributing 90 degrees phase shift out here. So we just shifted over omega t to the left without changing the phase response. So now we've got our uh, desired 55 degrees phase margin after dominant pole compensation. So having thus obtained our 55 degrees phase margin with dominant pole compensation, now we want an extra 30 degrees compensation using uh, lead compensation to give us a total of 85 degrees phase margin in this example. So again, you can play with the numbers depending on the specifications you're targeting, but um, in order to achieve an extra 30 degrees of phase margin, we're going to want to place the zero frequency at about 1.7 times the unity gain frequency, because doing so will cause the 
uh, left half plane zero to contribute a phase shift of exactly plus 30 degrees at omega t. And uh, that's just can be found by a trigonometric relationship but because of the, the numerator term one plus s omega z that uh, over omega z that's the source of the zero. Okay, so um, remembering that omega z is approximately at a frequency of one over RCCC, then we can rearrange that into an expression that allow us to calculate the value of RC that we need to place omega z wherever we want. And in this case, we want it at 1.7 times omega t. And again, this factor here may change if we're looking for only 20 degrees extra lead compensation or where we can always compute that from uh, the inverse tangent function as shown here. So what will introducing this uh, value of RC do? It'll again, it'll give us that left half plane zero somewhere out here in this sketch. which will uh, not affect the magnitude or phase response at low frequency, but which will just give it an extra kick up here at high frequencies. So that, and uh, as far as the magnitude response goes, it will change it only at frequencies, you know, only noticeably at frequencies above the unity gain frequency. So it shouldn't have hardly any effect on omega t, but the phase response, it will give us the extra plus 30 degrees that we're after for a total of about 85 degrees phase margin in total here. Now it is possible that when you play with all these compensation network components that you will slightly shift around the second poles or some other poles or zeros that can cause the phase margin to be a little bit off from what you're targeting. So if you find after step four here that the phase margin is still not adequate, then you can always circle back and increase CC a little bit further while leaving RC constant. That'll just give you a little bit extra dominant pole compensation, and uh, eventually you can finally essentially trade off bandwidth for more phase margin until you've achieved your spec. Now, it may be preferable to actually replace the lead compensating resistor with a transistor and triode, as shown here. Um, this can be preferable just from a pure area standpoint. The transistor may be a lot smaller than a poly resistor for RC. Um, in any case, if you do wish to do that, just be sure that the transistor is placed on the um, left side of the capacitor in the schematic as shown here. The reason being is that there's, remember, a lot less swing on this node than there is at the output node because the two voltages are related by the gain of the second stage, which presumably is not too small. And the triode resistor Q9 is not really a linear resistor. It'll only look like a resistor for relatively small changes in VDS. So, um, or, and, and VGS as well. So by keeping the triode transistor on the left side of the schematic, you ensure that its source and drain are subject to smaller voltage variations and therefore its VGS remains more constant and its uh, channel resistance remains more constant so it looks more linear. If you put it on the right side, while the output voltage is swinging all over the place, then RDS will change as that voltage is swinging, and it may you may uh, observe nonlinear uh, responses and um, and even uh, and worse. So, um, having calculated the desired value of the lead compensating resistor RC in the last step, you can 
just replace it with an appropriately sized transistor Q9, depending on the gate voltage applied uh, and the technology parameters using this expression here. Here's an example with actual simulation results, just to show you that, you know, really this cookbook procedure can work quite well in, in practice with, you know, just literally just following the recipe. So in this case, we started with a compensation capacitor value of two picofarads, and that gave rise to the frequency response shown in red. And, and remember that that value is chosen to provide you something like about 45 degrees phase margin. But all that's really required is that the dominant, the, the first and second pole frequencies be separated so that you can clearly, you know, have this region where the phase response is at around 90 degrees and you've clearly got a dominant pole and a slope of minus 20 dB per decade for a while. Um, having done that, then, you know, you looking at the red phase response plot here, we identify that at about um, 20 megahertz in this case, you've got a phase margin of, you would have a phase margin of 55 degrees. And then reading up here, you can see that that corresponds to an A prime value of um, something like three or four. So um, in fact, this 2.5 here, so that CC then had to be increased by a factor of 2.5, resulting in a compensation capacitor value of five picofarads. That then shifted the magnitude response plot back to the green line, which you can't see here because it's right below the blue line. But the green line indeed put the, you know, the gain crossover frequency, the omega t unit gain frequency, right where we wanted it at 20 megahertz. So the green phase response is shown here and now. So now we've got our 55 degrees phase margin. And then finally, we calculate that a lead compensating resistor of 850 ohms is required to give us that 30 degree bump in phase margin. That's what the factor 1.7 corresponds to here, 30 degree bump. And then when we introduce RC, we get the phase response changing as shown with the blue plot here, bumps it up to about 80, 85 degrees. And you see that the unity gain frequency omega t hardly changes when we go from the green plot to the blue plot. Uh, it changes at higher frequencies, but the zero has very little effect on the unity gain frequency down here.